Hi, Ritu. How are you? I can't hear you. Okay. Yes, I can hear you now. You can Great. hear me now. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Perfect. Okay. So, shall we? I'll just cue us in and then we go live. Sounds good. Great. Hello and welcome everyone to this conversation on uh, scale and impact. Uh, we are delighted to have Ritu Verma from Ankur Capital joining us. Before we get into this conversation, let me just quickly introduce We Scale Impact and what we do. Uh, we are a consulting firm based out of Boston and uh, we work with various emerging market entrepreneurs in scaling their uh, enterprises. And one of the themes that we have seen in the last year, particularly, is uh, how challenging it has been for companies who are particularly working in difficult markets and given the situation, how things have been. So we are very delighted to have Ritu on uh, this first episode and uh, we'll have a fantastic conversation. So Ritu, uh, maybe you can talk about Ankur Capital and a little bit of background but also uh, talk to us about uh, this last 12 months and you know how has it been for your portfolio companies and what are the kinds of challenges and maybe some uh, interesting ways in which companies have been able to overcome uh, the challenges. Definitely, thank you uh, for that. Um, so um, I'll, I'll start with myself. So I, I, I'm actually a physicist. I started life out with a PhD in physics. So I'm used to hard problems and uh, sort of, you know, somewhere I was forced to think that's how things al always work, unfortunately. But um, I think a lot of the uh, what we do at Ankur Capital is to be making early stage investments. They're hard. Any early stage entrepreneur is hard. And, you know, sometimes when you're pioneers in certain markets, it's even harder because you're paving the way you don't have anyone to follow behind. We invest fairly early in the companies and we look to support them through um, the early part of their growth, I should say. So uh, we've invested across now close to about 20 companies. Um, our investment thesis is, uh, you know, technology led. Right. So the core of the fund, what we are looking at is that how can technology actually disrupt uh markets for the next billion or the mass markets or the low income markets whichever one you sort of like and we we've been investing in seeing how um you know there's been a lot of digital penetration that has kind of happened and how business models can reach what i call fairly uh you know difficult to reach customers or producers and how how can you actually connect them to markets and make that more efficient and on the other side uh, we're actually investing in things which are, you know, uh, product disruptions, if I may call it that, which says, look, how, how can you actually create the products that are relevant for these next markets uh, is, is, is sort of at the core. Uh, so our, our portfolio spans from, you know, ag debt to health to some education, uh, some what I would call vernacular stuff food, so a pretty broad spectrum. We're actually sector agnostic, um, and but we are not market agnostic. So we need to see a pathway uh, and clear linkages to how that business is going to create a positive impact in 
the markets that it is in our markets, not what the market it wants to go to. So that that is very clear uh, as to what we sort of do here. Um, you know, Ashwin, coming back to uh, your question about last year. So uh, last year and why last year even now continues to be a very tough situation in India. I think the different um, different sectors saw different kinds of pushes. And whether you were a technology company or if you were a much more physical company, obviously there was impact to what happened. So across the board, what we saw is that there was tailwinds behind some of the sectors that we'd invested in because they're fundamentally core sectors, things that people can't do without food. Health somewhat depended on what you were doing in health. Uh, there was discretionary health and there was necessary health. And obviously the two fell into different buckets and one got hit very hard and the other one less so, or saw tailwinds. And of course, education and any technology-led stuff had an advantage over things that did not. And those all guys all saw tailwinds. So um, I think uh, perhaps the largest thing that all entrepreneurs across the portfolio or not that I spoke with faced here is the uncertainty of it all, right? You don't know what you're planning for. You don't know what sort of good plan. And, you know, prime example where we were sitting comfortably and uh, everyone thought we were beyond it, but of course we are far from beyond it, right? So, so um, I think uh, what you actually saw Ashwin come out here was uh, human nature in many ways of how people tackled a lot of these problems. Uh, and, uh, you know, the hustle that all our entrepreneurs bring to the table of actually overcoming it, right? Using different means, different distribution channels for what had been closed, you know, figuring out how to open up, how to not open up, you know, what was essential, what was not essential, how to manage those, how to like work with many other different providers when, you know, for some companies, demand just went up, which they weren't ready to actually deliver. So mm. you had to increase your partnerships dramatically. And, you know, so that again, hustle in order to make it happen. So um, I, I would say wide ranging stuff, but I, at the core of it, you saw the hustle of an entrepreneur come out in this situation. Right, right, right. And do you see any, uh, you know, from the portfolio across these various sectors, was there uh, some learnings that you think were interesting to share from how, you know, entrepreneurs were able to hustle and uh, uh, overcome uh, these channels, challenges? Absolutely. So the one learning that I saw, Ashwin, was, uh, you know, people thinking laterally, right? So, I mean, I might be doing health, but maybe I tie up with education, you know, or I tie up with this. So just thinking outside the box, because we were thrown out of the box, like literally here, right? So if you stuck to whatever was your, um, you know, core, and I think in, in the old world or the non-pandemic world, what you'd have done is you'd have made small steps and, you know, whatever. But I think the one thing that worked across the board was thinking laterally. So I'll give you an example, right? We are invested in a breast cancer detection company called Niramai. And Niramai, um, you know, was absolutely amazing at this, right? So they were trying to run clinicals and, you know, be in hospitals and, you know, they fell into the quote unquote discretionary bucket here, right? But what did Niramai, Niramai had a core technology. They could use it for fever. They could use it to look at, you know, uh, people's uh, CT scans. So they started you know, exploring a lot of things which were not in their purview at all. And pre-pandemic, they would never have done that. And and so you see how there were different solutions that came up and then obviously different partners, right? I mean, uh, Nirama never worked with the railways to screen passengers on a station. This was a partnership that wouldn't have come out had it not been pandemic led. Right, right, right. No, so, the, so those are two interesting uh, ways companies have uh, leveraged this. One is you said, they looked at their core ability and said, what is the lateral application to this? But you also are saying that they found unique partnerships yeah. to leverage, yeah. right? Which yeah. they would have never done. Never so, done. Uh, and, and do you think that this is sort of a temporary move for a company like Niramaya or uh, Niramaya, or this has opened a whole new avenue for their growth or scale? We're still in the midst of this, Ashwin. So I don't know. I mean, I can tell you the demand is high. <laughs> Right, yeah, basically. Absolutely. Now, so that I think that's the one part, right? That uh, you know, 
it's all uncertain. We don't know where you settle. So everybody says new normal. I actually mm. don't think there is a normal right now. We are all in uncertain yeah. times. So, yeah. um, so I can tell you this is the new normal today, but it's not the new normal tomorrow. So what are we talking about? So I think mm. that's the challenge. The uncertainty across, um, you know, uh, across the board for entrepreneurs has mm. been very, very high. Now, if you like, for example, if there's overwhelming demand online, right? And we're all talking about how this has accelerated human behavior to consume online or buy online. Not human, I mean, in, in, in especially in Indian context, et cetera, here. Now, tomorrow, everything goes away. What part retains is yet to be seen, right? The mm -hmm. hypothesis is that we've all got used to it, we'll be fine staying, right? Right. But in another state, do we actually change and say, God, I really want to go into a shop. I do not want to touch a computer screen to order my groceries anymore. Or, you know, I mean, I don't know. So yeah. that is the uncertain yeah. thing. So. Yeah. But, uh, you know, a related question to that, uh, Ritu. So how do, you, how do you deal with this uncertainty on the investi company side? You know, clearly this is an unprecedented uh, uh, time. But uh, as a fund, how do you view these uh, things? Uh, you know, how do you, how do you, I mean, so let's break it yeah. into two pieces. As a fund, how do you handle this? And second is, what are the ways in which your organization has been able to support or, uh, you know, facilitate some of these transitions? Ashan, I think we're very clear. Survival is important to do anything on the other side, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, You've got to do what it takes. Some people have the luxury and the cushion of money, mm. and but at this point of time, I'll say no matter how much. I mean, okay, they're sitting on billions of dollars. I don't know what to say. It depends also on how much you're burning every month. Right. But um, you know, um, if you have the cushion of money and there's an expectation of a certain amount of time, you know, perhaps you have the luxury of it, right? But perhaps you don't, right? I mean, the, the length of this whole thing is also something that is up in the air, as we've seen, right? So where is the other side? Nobody knows. So as a fund, I think survival is priority number one. And that's how we looked at it across the portfolio, right? Um, you know, uh, so if there are revenue streams, if there are things that you can kind of leverage with what you sort of had, you know, I mean, the company's all in our portfolio, but, you know, there's a company that was sort of doing, um, you know, technology for like gated communities, which then started getting used for passes for vehicles during lockdowns, right? So, I mean, it is... It, Short term doesn't matter, but it's something that's helping your survival. So I think that was priority number one. Yeah. Sorry, your second question. I missed that, or I forgot. Uh, se second question was around, uh, you know, how do you, as an organization, uh, support companies in in this transition? Like, what what are the things that organizations like yours could do in these kind of situations? So I I think is as entrepreneurs come up with ideas to be able to connect them, to be able to help get through blocks, use and leverage our networks is what we could do, right, mm. essentially. Mm. And at that point, that is what we did. And we still do, it, I would say. So scrambling to say, OK, look, if you think we can do this, let me see who we can talk to. Let me see who we can get partnerships accelerated from, right? So it's like hands rolled up, like, you know, moving with whatever is needed and saying, what is the best that we can pull in here? That, that, that that's pretty much it. And I think the second part of it, which I think is important to talk about, um, I mean, there is no doubt that the pandemic, you know, cost cutting was part of what had to happen in many places, right? And and it's 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 a it's a difficult thing, right? It's a it's especially young organizations, right? Because you're it's a uh, you know I mean it's a small team. This is a disruptive event, right? It's like one a small boat with one guy leans over can tip the boat is how it all works, right? So I think to manage the organizational pieces of it was also something. And I think a lot of what we did was to be able to facilitate conversations, to say that, look, uh, you know, here are how people have done with it. You know, what are, you know, because each person takes away for their own. So I, we've always believed to bring different perspectives to the table. And what works for someone may not work for another entrepreneur. So how do we get those perspectives in of how people have navigated this, you know, best, best strategies, allowing conversations to happen around that. So I think there was support on the fundamental organization level as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. 
So, uh, Ritu, maybe we can shift from uh, you know the COVID-specific things and uh, come back to what we wanted to talk about, which is scale and impact. Yeah. Uh, scale and impact uh, definitely means different things to different people, different organizations, and what stage you are. Uh, from your perspective as an organization, what, what do you consider these two things to be? What does scale mean and what does impact mean? And how do you even measure those? Got it. Let me start with the impact first, okay? Mm -hmm. Because I think that's an important question. And I know that everybody has, um, you know, different lenses on it. I'll tell you what it means for us and what we do with it, right? So I think for us, impact breaks down into two buckets. One of what we call a direct impact, where, you know, as I said earlier, we have, you know, we'd like companies to be in a certain target population and we want to sort of see how people in those populations are benefiting from this kind of business or business model directly. Yeah. So the person that you're intending to target is, is, is a direct beneficiary. We have a second one, which I think is a bit more complex for people to sort of digest, but for us, very, very critical in what we call structural impact, right? Where if you don't address things like this, people in lower income groups actually don't have stand much of a chance in kind of, um, you know, changing their status. Yeah. So both those categories are very important to us. What we do at the start of an investment, we look at it as that, look, we're going in, we're taking a financial risk. And if you may do an investment, you're thinking about the financial risks that you're taking, what are the risks to the business, what are the risks for it, right? We go in very early into a company, very similarly, I think we sit on an impact risk. There is an impact scale that we're expecting, which is dependent on the specific company. So I can't answer your question of what does scale mean as a whole. I mean, obviously scale means that you have to impact a lot of lives at some point of time. But we're, we know we're here for part of an entrepreneur's journey. So during that time, what kind of scale would we like to see? So very often what we would take a look at is um, sometimes it's about how many people that you reach, but sometimes it's also about like, let's say if you're a B2B company, if I want to make sure that what you have developed is a solid solution, I want many different people in the system to sort of adopt it, right? So it could be a government, it could be an NGO, it could be a corporate, it could be, you know, multiple, multiple different types. You would cut things very differently. Scale for us would mean is that you are actually seeing adoption, repeats and growth in a broad spectrum of these customers here, right? Because then we know that you have a solid foundation and you can grow on top of that foundation because you have a product or a service that meets the need of a broader thing. And if we want to impact 100 million lives, 20 million lives, the more ways that you your solution gets to them, the larger that will be eventually down the line. So that's why scale is not an easy question to answer. It means something different for the different kinds of impact that we are looking at. Right, right. But clearly what you are saying is as long as you can see a path to scale and impact, you know, it could be limited in your journey with the company, but, you know, it should eventually have the vision to uh, absolutely. create that impact. Absolutely. So that is that. Absolutely. I mean, at the entry point of a company, we're looking to see what's the change that you can make, right? Hmm. And for how many people, hmm. right? Hmm. So fundamentally, that is there. Part of our journey, you may not reach less in numbers, but you need to have the potential to actually create that change. Right, right. And when you look at it, you know, maybe one year, two year, three year down the line, during the journey, are there specific metrics that you have in mind or how does the how does the evaluation of this happen? So as I said, we, we actually go in defining what we expect in the short term, medium term and long term of our investment horizon. Yeah, okay. basically. What is it that we're expecting? What is the change? What is the metrics that we are associating with it? And those are the metrics that we measure. And they're different for each company. They're not the same. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Now, um, yeah, what sorry. that misses, sorry, just to add, what that misses, um, I, I mean, we get this wrong. That's why I said we take an impact risk. We get this wrong. Okay, so let's be clear. We get investments wrong. We also get impact wrong, just the same way. Right. Mm -hmm. So we are, you know, might have a hypothesis of what you might go do. And right. what I really love is when we get it wrong, but actually the impact is much more larger yeah. than yeah. 
I ever imagined, right? And we have an right. example where we went in into an agritech company saying, hey, you know, because of this thing, you know, people's yields will be whatever, higher. Yeah, mm -hmm. so a farmer makes more money. But honestly, the larger impact was the fact that the whole crop didn't fall apart, right? So the reduction on complete losses was the much deeper impact in many ways, right? That happened, whether I got 10% more or not was nice, but you know, whatever, I'll take it or leave it. But the fact that I didn't lose my entire crop was a much deeper impact, right? So I think one of the things that we've learned along the way is that, um, you know, we're learning about the impact. So the qualitative pieces of some of this are not something that you can just capture by numbers, right? Sometimes it's about sort of going out there and talking to customers and talking to people and seeing how this has actually made a difference. I'll give you an example. We invested in an eye care company and, uh, you know, for some reason, uh, you know, not some reason, I'll tell you the reason, right? But, you know, you're, they were counting how many men and women came to their clinics. There was a lot more women than men. And we were like, you know, why why do you not want the men to come? Like, what's the deal? Or why do the men not come really, right? And you realize that as you bring healthcare access closer to, uh, you know, places that don't have it, more women access it, right? Men may still continue their whole trajectory of going wherever the hell they were going, but it automatically brings more people because it's, it's less of a burden to be going to the city or whatever to get, to get it, right? Completely not on our horizon when we looked at this but an unintended consequence of it. So I think uh, as markets evolve, as business models evolve, I think we have to look for these uh, interesting ways in which you can both scale reach and, and impact. And yeah. during the conversation, you mentioned a couple of things, you know, how, um, you know, obviously you are there to support the entrepreneur during the journey uh, by making introductions and uh, looking at, some of the things that you're doing, but as a fund, have you seen, or have you as a organization or other funds, have you seen uh, ways in which um, funds have supported non-financially other than the investment or what are the best practices of supporting entrepreneurs in their journey to scale? Very good question. Okay. So, our start of our journey at Anchor Capital, right, was the fact that, look, money alone is not enough. So we our, our philosophy from day one has been that we invest money, but we also want to in, invest, um, you know, to help an enterprise grow, right, whatever that means. And I think it's been a journey for us to understand what that means. And just like any other entrepreneur, we've learned what works, what doesn't really work. And uh, we're still learning, I would be honest about that. So I think, um, you know, uh, if I look back in retrospect, right, uh, and, and I'm talking about the stage of the company, the companies that we come in at, right? I think, I think one of the things that we've done is, we, you know, we brought in a lot of things. Our first hypothesis here was that, look, we are the kind of this, uh, you know, help be CXOs to these companies. So we had like people in marketing, we had people in HR, we had people in finance saying, look, we'll support this company in, in, in in what they're doing because you know they're not really going to go hire a, you know a CFO and whatever else in these early days right yeah i think the thing that we've sort of uh, learned over that time that there is time you know there is a spacing of how a support like this is sort of needed so it's like a child growing up right the needs as a baby versus a toddler versus whatever are different so we can't really take what's needed at the toddler level and shove it down at the at the infant level, if I may say that, right? So what's fairly critical at the early stage companies here are two things, I think. One is the fact is that most entrepreneurs at this time are trying to get their product market fit sorted, right? Which means trying to hustle and get as much adoption as possible, hopefully sales, but definitely adoption, right? So how can we actually help accelerate that? And that is a core area that we actually take a look at here. How do we define that Yes, you may want to do A, B, C, D, right? But let's see, what is it that we want to achieve in six months? What is it that we want to achieve in one year, right? And how do we focus down and make sure that we get those adoptions to happen in that what we're focused on to sort of do? That's one part. And I think the second part of it is actually, you know, underestimated, but I actually think a very critical part. It's critical for us as entrepreneurs, and I see this critical for entrepreneurs who are part of a portfolio. You know, you're in the weeds. So for you to have a mirror, 
is very, very important. So if you have someone that you trust who's in, who's, who's kind of has the skin in the game and he can be a sounding board for the things that are, you know, and that you can see, you know, where you are headed is a very, very useful thing. We do it all the time for us, right? We are in the weeds of sort of investing in the companies, right? But, you know, I, we're so thick in the weeds that, it, you know, it takes effort to step out and it's helpful to have, you know, a sounding board of people. And that's the second thing that we do. So these are two things that I feel are super critical. There's a whole bunch of other areas we help in supporting, you know, getting talent, setting up MISs, you know, all of these nice things. But I, I still think the other two things are very, very critical in the early part of the journey. And the other thing that is has no replacement is fundraising. I mean, that's a constant right. thing it uses. And, and that, as an early stage investor, that is something that we do yeah. all the time. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, it's interesting you mentioned how you try to bring the CXO level expertise and it was sort of a misfit uh, of some sorts, uh, maybe too early, too late, yes, whatever. It's right? too right. early. It's yeah. too early. We see it kicking in after organizations cross, let's say, a certain team size or right. revenue, right? Where after which point all of those are needed and those yeah. then help at that point of time. But it's yeah. just, you know, you have to get the timing of these things right, right? right. So, right. Uh, you know, we lots of people complain, oh, they don't know how to, uh, you know, they can't do their finances right or whatever, right? Like, I mean, yeah. all of that. Yeah, that's fine, right? I mean, that's like telling an infant they can't read their ABCDs, right? Yes. Like, okay, but I got to walk first, man, before I start reading right. my ABCDs, right? So I think that's super important. Yeah, yeah. I also remember, it. you used to do these sessions where you used to invite other entrepreneurs. I think yeah, I've been yeah. a member of those. What has been your experience there getting people who have gone through those? Uh, amazing. I yeah. the, the you know uh, the one thing that we have done from day one, which we will never give up, <laughs> is getting under entrepreneurs to talk to entrepreneurs, right? And um, I think the you know it's such a journey, right? That, it, that there is so much empathy. It doesn't matter. You could be like you know a unicorn or a sunicorn. I don't care. But the memory of that journey at the front step and things that you did right and things that you did wrong stays with you for life. I'm sure Ashwin, it stays with you. Yeah. And and that's a, a learning, you know, I mean, you can't replicate that, right? You can't have someone give you a lecture about these things, right? It's like, you know, strategies that you used, you know, all of that. That is a learning that we have seen cross board here. And that's why, as I said earlier, I think different people learn differently or taken things differently. So for us to be able to pull in entrepreneurs at different stages of their journeys, I mean, later stage, obviously, because we are dealing with early stage entrepreneurs. Sometimes we even have our entrepreneurs talk to our entrepreneurs, you know, I mean, describe their how they navigated situations. And, you know, not every entrepreneur who comes in resonates with everybody in the group, right? It may resonate with five. That's all right. We've come to learn that that's all right. Earlier, we would say, oh, man, you know, that didn't work or whatever didn't work. But the, the diversity of thoughts, the diversity of approaches opens up minds of entrepreneurs to think about how to do it because people before them have done some of this. Yeah, I think that's an uh, interesting uh, sort of uh, area of the spear learning. And through our own journey, we found that uh, that has been uh, of any any investor group that we've been part of. I think the biggest value we got out was the peer learning, yeah. more than more than any expert coming in. Yeah, uh, no, the experts are useless. Sorry, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean uh, they're useless for us, right? At some level, because yeah. it's a, it's a it just doesn't have that whole empathy touch. Hmm. You can't hmm. deliver it the same way. Right, right, right. Now, we have an interesting comment from Ameya that uh, in such uncertain times have you faced scenarios where you have to support some entrepreneurs with keeping trust of their teams you know uh, because they uh, might maybe the second part and you're right i mean i think this was an emotional upheaval right basically and i think uh, you know one entrepreneur said this and said you know i mean uh, mentally right i mean it's a really difficult situation, mm -hmm. right? So I think uh, I would say without doubt that, you know, talking to entrepreneurs through this journey, I don't think we did the teams, right? It was much more of our the founders here 
of being able to kind of manage teams. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So uh, not directly going down to the teams to have a chat or whatever it was, but more, you know, people reached out, you reached out and so the emotional support through this whole case was a very critical piece. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, right, right. So the other question now is what next, right? I think hopefully we will pass uh, this phase. If you, you probably know, <laughs> please tell me when. <laughs> I'm yeah. the yeah. I mean, so so the answer is we will pass. Uh, we don't yeah. know when, right? Yeah. So wave two, wave three, wave four, uh, we don't know. So somebody who's uh, early stage, you know, trying to figure out how to scale, how to, you know, make impact, what are the things that they should be thinking of, given that this is a you know complete new normal or whatever you call it? How should companies uh, which are in the early stages of thinking and impact, uh, thinking of impact and scale, what should they be looking out for? What are the building blocks that should in invest in um, and strengthen uh, till the markets open up again? So I'm going to distinguish two situations, right? Um, one is lockdown, okay, which is a you know uh, where things are completely shut, right, and the markets are not accessible, or some markets are some things are not accessible. But I think there is a phase of which in which things are open, but it may not be normal, right, or the normal we were used to. Let me put it this way, right? Yeah, right. I think the lockdown piece is you know, it is what it is and you have to do what it is. And uh, there's really, I don't have much sort of advice on that. I think on the other part of this thing, I think the markets are open, right? So I, I, I think that, um, you know, obviously, I mean, even if I take, let me just take an extreme situation of travel, right? And you sort of see the different strategies that people are using, like pay now, go later. You know, I mean, all sorts of things to be able to get that kind of cash in. So my advice to entrepreneurs is, you know, don't treat this as a time to not explore. Find new ways to reach your customers, learn more about your customers, right? I think uh, I've been surprised by how many people still want to, um, you know, lot, do a lot of things which they were used to. Uh, and so... You know, I understand some physicalities, etc. Obviously, you cannot do, but I think to explore what you can do and discover those. I mean, I will just just let's take this example, right? We're doing this webinar kind of thing, and this is life is kind of normal. We've been sort of doing this, right? Um, we could all have just said, "Forget it." So if we can't meet, we can't do this, right? But we've come up with a way of sort of doing it, and. You know, presumably some portion of it will continue to stay. So whatever you learn through here will perhaps remain part of your business going forward. So no reason not to kind of explore this. So you made two uh, distinct points here. One is use this time to sort of understand your customer, your customer segment, your market better. And second, you are saying that, you know, figure out how you can thrive in this yeah. new environment, right? To figure out what, what parts of your model uh, uh, can, can can thrive. Now, going beyond your fund and your organization uh, in the last few months or maybe before COVID, any good examples of organizations who have used innovative ways to scale impact? You know, something that you would say, okay, this is something we can show uh, or, or, or use as an example or showcase to your portfolio companies or anything like that that uh, comes to mind? Yeah, so I'm going to give you this example. It's not an Indian example, but it's a, you know, it's a Chinese example, right? And I was on a call this morning, and so perhaps it's fresh in my mind. So there's a company called Pindodo, and I'm sure most people know what it is, right? It was, um, it's a Chinese company. And it's an e-commerce company that uh, does group buying, yeah. Um, I mean, they have 780 million customers, and you know, majority of what you would assume would be electronics and the normal stuff that sort of goes, goes through e-commerce companies, right? But um, absolutely amazing what they're doing on the agricultural front. So, uh, you know, they leverage this platform uh, to actually, and they did some of this during COVID, 
yeah, and COVID threw up some of these opportunities of saying, look, farmers go through many different means. So the Chinese agricultural ecosystem sounds very similar to India's, where there's small farmers who go through multiple middlemen by the time they get to the consumer and actually don't make much money. So they use this platform to be connecting farmers to customers and uh, have scaled this to about like $42 billion of produce going straight from farmers to consumers. Yeah, right. So, uh, you know, it, to me, it's just interesting that there is a company that, uh, you know, started life out as a, in a very different way, has incorporated impact at a level and scale that every development institution in the World Bank is now asking, like, how did you do this at this scale? Um, and enough so, you know, they're working with governments and governments of different provinces. You know, they've, they've roped in China Post, which is like, you know, India Post or whatever, the places where logistics aren't there, to actually really change the game or for, for a farmer. The farmer is now putting up videos about what they're growing, Customers are seeing what's happening, placing orders for the future. You know, I mean, just unheard of. So I think that sometimes impact can come sideways. And I think we should just keep looking out as to how we could scale that impact sideways. So, you know, that's a very interesting example uh, because in COVID, many people have pivoted to the health side. Yeah. And this one seems to have gone the other, but you know, it looks like. Uh, customer base which had trust, uh, which trusted them, right? So they could pivot to to some some other segment of the market. So I think or, the many things in the Chinese ecosystem on the trust, you know, it's a little bit different. I won't compare it exactly to India. Sure. But, sure. You know, uh, uh, one other piece that I wanted to add on this whole thing, right? So this entire piece of it, right? It's not like it's super. I mean, they have a different way of how they monetize this entire piece from their hmm. business perspective, right? So they're actually leveraging this to monetize somewhere else, right? Okay. And giving the farmer the full full benefit of this, hmm. you know, customer price here, hmm. right? Hmm. Which is, you know, very hard for people to do, right? Because right. at the end of the day, you have to take away money to do something. I mean, you at the end of the day, most people are middlemen again. Right, right, right. right. So uh, the, the other, other sort of, uh, question or topic that we can talk about is given what has happened in the last few uh, months uh, would your uh, sector focus shift in any way and uh, the second question is uh, um, are there things that you would uh, do differently in terms of finding finding startups now given what what has happened in the few months um not really we don't okay. really have to have i mean i think the the, the sweet spot that we sit in is that primarily majority of the sectors that we looked at were essential core sectors, you know, health, agriculture, food, education, you know, all of those, not discretionary sectors. And those continue, you know, from an even from an investment perspective, they continue to be perfectly fine to invest in. So we're not moving away from any of that. I'm sorry, your second question. Sorry, uh, Ashwin, I perhaps lost that. You said. Yeah, second question was uh, you know one is the focus and second is the type of companies that you would uh, look at you know you said that there is uh, sort of a uh, resilience of some entrepreneurs to figure out how to pivot now would that also define your future filter if you will like you know you would be looking at it from companies perspective is this the kind of person that would be able to handle shocks like this because I think this is real, no? Like we say, this is not the first pandemic, neither it will be the last. So I think that's when we've always looked for resilience in entrepreneurs, right? So I think okay. that's a trait that, uh, you know, a, a pandemic or no pandemic, right? I mean, there are ups and there are downs. If you can't make it through the downs, it's really hard to be an entrepreneur. Right. It's not it's this is not a story of highs only. So resilience is a critical trait. Yeah. So that I don't think is new. Right. I think the pandemic, you know, put on all sorts of other emotional pressures on us. Right. Yeah. Um, which can happen through the course of an entrepreneur's journey. Hmm. Right? Perhaps it accelerated demonstrating whether you were resilient enough or not. But right. I, I, 
I even yet to see an entrepreneur where resilience is not a trait that is necessary. Right, right, right. So there's another question uh, here which says, uh, do you expect to make more, fewer, or the same number of investment going forward, uh, given the situation? So the way we work, we're a close-ended fund, and there's a strategy of deployment and the number of companies, etc. That all hasn't changed for us, right? Uh, I think initially the pace of deployment slowed because we were also trying to figure. I mean, we're used to doing very physical due diligences and meetings, etc all of which were put on hold. So that slowed, but I think things have, we've settled into this new normal. So I, I don't think that there are, I think it's amazing to actually see that entrepreneurship is thriving at such times, which um, is, is great. Yeah. So we, we as an organization, uh, you know, we, we work with uh, various entrepreneurs in, in the African region and also South America and, and, and other parts. One of the things that we are seeing is that uh, uh, this cross collaboration between entrepreneurs, uh, which was rare before, right? So now it's somebody who's in the health space is now, you know, trying to work with somebody in agri and, and vice versa. Are you seeing that also in your portfolio companies or, or in the ecosystem? So we do see collaborations, but as an investor, I would say I'd like to see much more. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. so I think there still could be much more, right? I don't think right. entrepreneurs leverage other entrepreneurs enough. Right, right. So that was one piece, I mean, from a business point of view. The other one is um, in the last few months, a lot of these peer networks uh, where people are coming in and sharing, you know, what are they trying to, how are they dealing with this issue? How are they dealing with, you know, very tough decisions like layoffs are, are something that nobody is equipped to do, right? Absolutely. So how do you create this environment where people can sound off each other on what is the best way to handle it, or you're slowing down or you're cutting down, whatever it is. So those kind of experiences? No, uh, but that's what we do, Ashwin, with our peer-to-peer -peer learning things, basically, right? So where we either invite the entrepreneur in, right? Uh, and interestingly, uh, people are fairly open. You know, I mean, it's what's on your mind, right? That you're talking about, like that you want your question answered. So if it's layoffs, it's layoffs, right? Basically. And so you're, but it has to sort of be an intimate group for this to kind of warm up as opposed to, you know, a, a more one-way kind of thing here. There's uh, so many uh, fascinating um, sort of things happening. Uh, it's always goes back to your your point that you know entrepreneurs will figure out a way to yeah. find a solution, overcome these, and 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 go on. So I think we we started with talking about how uh, you know some of your portfolio companies have figured out a way to find alternate paths, find new customer segments. Uh, we spoke about uh, you know the the qualities required by the entrepreneurs to overcome these kind of challenges we also spoke about some new unique ways in people are collaborating i think these are all good learnings for people who are uh, either starting now or are thinking of uh, scale um, any last thoughts on things that we might not have touched upon concerning scale and impact that you want to leave the audience with passion passion okay yeah tell us more you you can't get through all of this you have to be passionate about doing this so yeah. ultimately it's the you know you can talk about money you can talk about all sorts of things but passion is what takes you towards your goal yeah yeah absolutely Great, uh, Ritu, thank you so much for taking the time. I know it's quite late in the evening, but uh, it was very, very helpful and uh, gave us a view of how, as a funder, you are thinking about some of the challenges that uh, companies who are in the impact and impact space might be facing, and also some examples that uh, you shared, which could be useful. Uh, I'm sure we will have this conversation again with uh, some other topic. So uh, in the meanwhile, thank you very much. and. Uh, Let's keep in touch. Thank you very much, Ashwin, for having me. Um, it was great to be here. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye.